Hi there, welcome to the next Intagma tutorial. Today I want to talk about an effect that you can see a lot in advertising, water droplets. The effect if a surface is covered in small drops of water and you render this with nice depth of field and it just looks pretty and makes the product or the object appear fresh. So basically this effect is very simple. It's just distributing spheres on the surface of an object. But there are some details that can make the effect look more realistic and more pretty. So I decided to do a tutorial about this kind of thing. I prepared a scene here with a pumpkin. I decided to use a pumpkin as my object to put the water drops on. And this pumpkin is uh, scanned, 3D scanned, and um, the scene is provided. You can download it from the link below the video. Inside of this scene, I have this pumpkin object. If I dive inside, it's just a file node that imports the OBJ geo file, transforms it, and then feeds it into a dotnet. And I make it fall because I want the pumpkin to sit exactly on the surface here. And then the stop import node just fetches the simulated object from the dotnet. And I froze this node, meaning that I now can scrub and nothing happens. Another possibility would have been to export the result and then re-import it. But this is a little bit more straightforward for you, because then you don't have to download a second BGO file. And then we have this out node. And then I build a cyclorama, so this background object here. This is very straightforward too, it's just a box with some poly splits and then a subdivide node in the end. And um, there are two area lights in the scene. One on the left that you can see here, and one on the right with different intensities that give a balanced lighting. And I have a camera. Okay, so let's start and build the water droplet effect. Let's put down a geonode and dive inside. But uh, before we dive inside, let's call these water droplets. Inside, we'll need a reference to the pumpkin because we want to distribute spheres on the surface of the pumpkin. So I need an object merge here. And this object merge will refer to my pumpkin object. Here it is. And don't forget to specify that this has to be transformed into this object. Otherwise, the transforms won't match. Here is our pumpkin. Now, the first thing is we don't have point normals, but we will need point normals later on. So put down a normal node. Let's generate point normals quickly. Point normals. Now we have blue point normals. If you wonder what happened here, the object comes with vertex normals, and these are green here in the viewport. And now that I created point normals, the normals are blue, indicating that these are point normals. And I want point normals because these are easier to work with. The next thing is that I want to subdivide my pumpkin. I will subdivide this in the render engine directly, but for cloning purposes, I want a subdivided object too, because I want to put my spheres on the subdivided object, not on the low poly. Like so. For now we can switch to hide other objects. Now we see our subdivided pumpkin. Very nice. Great. So time to scatter some points. Put down a scatter node and append it here. What about a scattering 1200 points? Like so. And uh, before we put spheres on these points, let's create a VOP to set the p-scale value. Point VOP. Like so. Point VOP. And call this set p-scale. It will do nothing for now. And now append a copy to points. Feed this into the template points and let's create a sphere. And we want to feed the sphere into the first input of the copy to points. And you see that you now get very large spheres. So time to set the p-scale actually. Let's dive inside the set p-scale node and think about how to set the p-scale values correctly. I'd like to vary my p-scale with a noise function. So let's put down an anti-alias noise, as this executes faster than the unified noise. And for our purposes, it's sufficient. Connect it here, because we need the sample position for the vex function to know where to look up the noise in space. And you have to know that the anti-alias noise node outputs values between minus 0.5 and 0.5. So to make it easier to work with this, we want to fit it 
So create a fit range node and append it here. And just fit the values minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to the value range of 0 to 1. Because now we can append a ramp node, a ramp parameter node, and we can use this to remap the distribution of the values even further. Switch this to a float ramp, because this is a float, and connect it here. Now we have the possibility to remap the values, but the values are still in the range between 0 and 1, and we need some possibility to set the final values for the minimum size and the maximum size of our spheres. So another fit node will do this. This will be used to transform the range between 0 to 1 to our final destination values. For this to work, let's promote the dest min and dest max values, because these are the values that the range will be mapped to. And then we need a bind export, call this pscale. This is a attribute name that is recognized by the copy to points, it's more or less built in, and connect it here. And you see, as soon as we do that, all the spheres in the viewport disappear, because they are all set to zero now, because all these values default to zero. Before we go one level up and set the values, let's first promote the frequency of the noise and the offset of the noise, because these two parameters are important for shaping the result. And go up one level. Now let's set the values. What about 0 0.005 and maximum radius will be 0 0.02, like so. And you see that you don't have any variation. That is due to the fact that the ramp is just set to zero and the ramp will remap the values. If you alter this, you get distribution. And by moving these knobs here, you can make the transition between small and big spheres a little bit harder. But the noise is very, very large, so increase the frequency to say 15, and you get a nice sort of random distribution of the sizes of these spheres. And note that these spheres are all aligned to the surface, and that is due to the fact that we have point normals. If we don't have point normals, the spheres would appear here on the surface with global orientation. Before we go on, let's go to the sphere and switch this to a polygon mesh and increase the subdivisions to say 24 and 48, because primitives cannot be converted to volumes later on. And you notice this odd shading here, and that is due to the fact that the copy to points node copies not only the geometry, but it transfers the template point attributes. For example, n. That means that all the points of the spheres get the n attribute of the surface underneath, and we want to avoid this. To avoid this, what we can do is, here in this field, just put a little hat and then n. You see, now you have the shading back. Cool, we are done! <laughs> Not really, because we have spheres on the surface now. But what we want is drops, and drops look a little bit different than just a sphere. Let's quickly turn, show all objects on, and you see we have nice spheres sitting here on the surface, but what we want is elongated drops. How can we accomplish this? Well, basically, in the end, I plan to turn all these spheres into a volume, and this enables me to put more than one sphere and then merge them all together with the volume. So what if I would put a smaller sphere above every sphere and then merge them together in the volume and blur them? That would give a drop-like shape. So let's try this. Well, basically we can just duplicate the point we have and then move them along the surface a little bit up. How can we do this? We need a vector that points along the surface in the up direction. And we can calculate such a vector with a double cross product. Before we implement this with a VOP, let me quickly explain to you what a cross product is and what I plan to do. When working with vectors, you can do different mathematical operations on them. You can state 
vector a plus vector b or a vector a minus vector b. And of course you can multiply vectors. You can state a dot b, the, the first type of vector multiplication. And then there is a cross b, that is a different kind of vector multiplication. Both are different in how the actual math is executed. So what exactly happens? But that is not important. Important is the geometric meaning of these operations. And the cross product gives you the vector that is orthogonal to the plane spanned by these two vectors. So it gives vector C. That means if I have a vector A here, and I have a vector B, these two vectors span a plane, this plane here. And C is the vector that is orthogonal to this plane. This is C. So this vector is perpendicular to the plane and thus it's a plane normal. That is very useful, especially in our case. Because in our case we want to find the vector along the surface. So imagine you have a surface. This is our surface here. And you have a point here. This is our point. And this point has a normal vector pointing outwards from the surface. This is n. Now, I want the vector that goes here along the surface in the up direction. How can I find this? Well, first I can define the global up direction. That is y. It's just global. And the vector is 0, 1, 0. That is the global y. And if I now do a cross product between the normal and this global y vector, what I get is, this is global y, y, I get the normal to this plane here. So the cross product will be something like this, a vector that is orthogonal to this plane, like so. And if I now do a second cross product, between this new found vector and n, I get the normal to this plane here that is spanned by this new vector and n. And you can easily see that this direction is exactly the direction we are looking for. The direction that is more or less in the global y direction, but along the surface. So by using two cross products, one after the next, we can find this vector and then we can display our original point along the surface in the up direction. Let's implement this. Create another point wop. Point wop and call this move along surface, like so. But we want to put this before the copy to points because we want to work on the input points. So connect it here for now. And this operates on all the points. Let me quickly make the points a little bit bigger so that you can see them better. Okay, now dive inside. The normal that we need, we already got. What we don't have is the global y direction. So create a constant and switch it to vector and just specify 0, 1, 0. This is global y. Let's call this global y, like so. And now let's do the double cross product. So cross, and we want to cross this global direction with the normal. And let's have a look on what we calculated. So let's quickly do a bind export, call this debug type is vector and connect this vector here. And now we can create a new visualizer, type vector and call this debug, like so, debug and debug, like so, close. And now we have this debug here. You see nothing because I wired this incorrectly. So let's quickly cut this connection to time and use n. And here you have the result. Let's make this vector a little bit smaller in scale, like so, show the error tips. And you see, as outlined in my 
drawing, the first cross product gives us a vector along the surface, but more or less in the horizontal direction. So, but watch closely. These two vectors, the new yellow one and our normals, form a plane, and the normal to this plane is exactly the direction that we want. So let's do another cross product. Turn the visualization off for now. And now cross the normal with the result from the first cross product. And let's put this into debug. And you see, this is exactly the vector we are after. Now we have vectors that point along the surface of the pumpkin in the up direction. These are exactly the vectors we want to have. Now let's use them and put down a displace along normal node. It's called displace along normal, but it displaces along every vector happily. So specify the vector by wiring the output of this cross product to the normal and then P into P. And now we can wire the result to global P, like so. And if I now use this displacement mount slider, you see that the points move along the surface in the up direction. That is exactly what we want. So let's put 0 0.01 0 .01 for now, like so. So now we have points and we have translated points. And what we can do now is just merge them together. Points, translated points, merge them together and wire this into the copy to points. If I make this active, now I not only have points or spheres on my surface, let me quickly turn the point display back again, but I now have two sitting on top of each other. And this already looks a little bit more like a droplet. To get closer to a droplet shape, we want to make the topmost spheres a little bit smaller. So dive again in our node. Let's clean this up a little bit so that it is not so confusing and get rid of the debug. We don't need it anymore. Displays along normal, geometry output. Uh, what we want to do is we want to scale them down. So let's bind P scale here. P scale, like so, and then just put down multiply constant. Let me quickly go up and switch packet instance on because then this will be more responsive again. Multiply constant and then a bind export, bind export. Again, P scale. Because we want to read the scale of the points, scale it down and then set it again. And if we now say 0 0.8, for example, you see that the topmost spheres are all smaller, giving more a drop-like shape. The problem is that the distance of displacement is the same on each drop. So no matter if the sphere is big or small, we have always the same displacement amount here or the same distance between the two spheres. This is not good because the small droplets really fall apart and the big ones stick too much into each other. So let's correct this. And we correct this by using P scale again. We want this distance to be large if the p scale value is high, and if the p scale value is low, we want the distance to be small. So, why don't we just use a fit range and use p scale? And now we want to, again, I wired this wrong, so be careful with wiring here, and we want to transform the p scale range back to a range of 0 and 1 because we want to use this as a multiplier. So we want to know the maximum and minimum p scale values. And we already know them because we set them ourselves. So if we just promote the source min and source max parameters, what we can do is we get these two channels here. And now we can go to the sets p scale where we 
specify these values and just say copy parameter and paste relative references and it's the same with the maximum value copy parameter paste relative references and now we have these values here and this will make the fit node transform all the p-scale values between 0 and 1. At the moment we just put the displacement amount here but that won't work anymore if we want to drive this amount with the output from this node chain here. So we will need a parameter and we call this parameter displacement amount like so displacement amount and now we can just multiply this displacement amount by this correction factor that we calculated and drive the amount with this all the spheres snap back to zero or to the old position because this displacement amount defaults to zero but if i now move that you can see that the spheres that are big move a large distance and here with the very small particles you see that no movement happens and that is not perfect either so let's put 0 0.02 here for example go inside and let's go to this fit node and up the destination bin a little bit 0 0.1 or maybe 0 0.2 to give even the small ones a little bit of displacement. So now you see that we have relative displacements regarding the sizes of the individual spheres, which gives much more natural results. Cool. The next thing is that the individual droplets are very, very round. And in reality, these drops would be a little bit flatter. So we want to make them flat. Let's make them flat. For this, I use an even another point warp and call this flatten. And append it here after the merge because it should affect all the spheres, the initial ones and the top ones. And dive inside. So, Making these spheres flat is basically very simple because there is not only an attribute called p scale, which is just a float and defines the scale in all directions uniformly, but there is a second template point attribute that the copy to points understands, and this is called scale. And scale is a vector. That means with the scale attribute, you can scale the individual copies differently in the three directions. So if we just bind export a new vector attribute and call it scale, like so, we can create a constant type vector and set this here and everything will disappear because as always this defaults to zero. But if I put 111 here, I have my spheres back. And then we can see that we can alter the scale just in Z to make them flatter. So let's halve the Z dimension. And now we have flat droplets. So now let's create the actual droplets. And I want to do this by using VDBs. So put down a VDB from polygons and let's convert these copies into a VDB. The voxel size is too large. Let's say 0 0.01, still too large, 0 0.001. And now I have a VDB signed distance field with my droplets. And this allows me to blur them. So VDB smooth SDF and this will blur all the droplets. Let's put this to Gaussian because this gives, gives more of a smoothing effect and really smears the two spheres into each other like so. But you see that they lose a lot of volume 
And to counteract this, let's append a VDB reshape. And this allows you to enlarge or shrink a VDB. So put this before the smooth. And let's just dilate them by a factor three. And if we now smooth them, they should maintain their volume more or less, like so. So before and after, pretty much the same. But it looks quite okay. Now we have actual droplets. But these droplets are still round. If I hide the pumpkin, you see that they go to the inside. And real droplets are, have a different curvature on the top and on the bottom. How can we achieve this? Well, make the pumpkin visible again. We can just turn the pumpkin into a VDB2 and subtract it from the droplets. So create a duplicate from this VDB from polygons and cut this connection and use the subdivide as an input, such that we create a sign distance field from the pumpkin itself. And now we can use a VDB combine. And we will use this before we do the reshaping and the smoothing. So we will combine the droplets and the VDB from the pumpkin. The operation is saying copy A, that's a standard, but we want to do the SDF difference. And if we do so, you see that the pumpkin is subtracted from our droplets. And if I now put this into the reshape and smooth, I get nice droplets that perfectly conform to the surface of the pumpkin. Very good, so this is pretty much it. We have just one last problem. And that has to do with the type of shader we want to apply. These droplets should be water, so they are transparent or refractive. And at the moment, the inner surface of the droplets is in the exact same position as the surface of the pumpkin. And that means that a ray tracing engine has a hard time figuring out the transition from water to pumpkin, because it has double surfaces there. And the render results will be so much better if the droplets would intersect the pumpkin a little bit, just a tiny little bit, which is not the case at the moment. So if we render this, this will get, give artifacts. So let's move all the droplets along the normal of the pumpkin inwards, just a tiny little bit. So I promise the last point wop for today. Point wop. Append it and make it visible. Ah, and don't forget to use a VDB convert, no, convert VDB, to turn the VDB into polygons first. So go here and say polygons, and thus this will give us polygons again. Now we can use a point wop. And let's call this move inwards. Dive inside. So this point wop runs over all the points of these droplets. But um, these points have normals that are specified by the surface of the droplets. But we need the normal of the underlying surface. How can we get this? Well, in Houdini, there is this XYZ distance function. And this XYZ distance function gives you the closest point on a primitive, on a surface from a sample location. So we can say, please sample where P is, so wherever a point is. And now we have to tell the XYZ disk function which surface it should sample via this input here. So we have to make the VOP aware of the surface. So grab the subdivide and put it into the second input here. Now we can dive inside and use the second input. So now this XYZ disk gives us a primitive number and a prim uv vector. And what this is, it's barycentric coordinates. So the primitive number tells us on which primitive of the surface the closest point lies, and the prim uv gives us a vector, a two-dimensional vector, the third coordinate is usually zero, that tells us where on this primitive the point lies. 
So this is not normal. What we want is the normal of the surface. So we have to sample it. And for this we use the primuv function, primitive attribute, primuv. We connect the same surface and then just tell the primuv the primitive and the uv coordinates or the barycentric coordinates. And then we can specify which attribute to sample. In our case it's n. Now we have the normal for every point of the droplets of the underlying surface. And now it's very easy because we again use just a displace by normal or displace along normal. We want to displace the points and the normal to use is this sample normal. So connect it here and then connect this to the global p. And if we now play with the amount you see that all the droplets are moved away from the pumpkin. So let's promote this parameter, go up one level and just put a negative number like zero minus 0 0.03 say. And you see now they are diving a little bit into the surface of the pumpkin. And this fixes all the rendering artifacts. So now append a null, call this out pumpkin or out droplets, just because this is good practice. Put the render flag and the visibility flag on it. And this concludes the modeling of water droplets on the surface of a pumpkin. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned something. I hope this was inspirational for you and see you next time. As always, a very big thank you to all our patrons on Patreon, especially Mohamed Alabri and Joseph Howerton. Thank you so much for supporting us and making this all possible.